Davenport, and I'm the university librarian, and we are the spon one of the sponsors of this series of Exploring Social Justice. The program is also co-sponsored by the Center for Diversity and Inclusion and K Spiritual Life Center. And in these programs, we bring to campus leaders from diverse backgrounds who are advocates for various human rights and social justice issues. And so today, I am very pleased to introduce to you Maya Van Rossum, the Delaware Riverkeeper. She has led the Delaware Riverkeeper Network for 23 years. And in 2013, Maya and her team won a watershed legal victory in Pennsylvania that not only protected communities from ruthless fracking, but breathed legal life into the constitutional right of people in the state to a clean and healthy environment. The role of the Delaware Riverkeeper is to give the Delaware River and the communities that depend upon it and appreciate it a voice at every table that is a decision-making place, particularly knowing that decisions made at those tables could either help or could do harm. The Delaware River Network works throughout the four states of the Delaware River watershed, New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, and Delaware, and at the national level. You will see from, the, from what you see right here on the screen that Maya is an advancing the Green Amendment movement, seeking to inspire and to secure constitutional protection for environmental rights across the nation. She is the author of the book, The Green Amendment, Securing Our Right to a Healthy Environment and you all have the opportunity to put your name into the pot out there because she's going to give away a free copy of her book. I am pleased to welcome you to our podium and sorry that I can't stay. I have to go get on an airplane. <laughs> Thank you so Thank much. You, Mark. I appreciate it. Safe travel. Thank you very much. Okay. Let's make sure I take, is this working? Is this working? Is anything working? <laughs> Is that one working? Okay. All right. Terrific. Um, so before I forget, there were slips outside, and if you don't have them, Molly can quickly grab some and pass them around. So if you want to receive um, or be put in for a drawing for a free copy of the book, this is going to be your opportunity um, to do so. And if I don't say it now, I'll forget. So. Um, again, I am Maya Van Rossum. I'm the Delaware Riverkeeper. I'm also the founder of a new movement, a new national movement called Green Amendments for the Generations. And that's what I'm really here to talk to you about. Now, the reason why it's important for you to know about me being the Delaware Riverkeeper and actually serving in that role at this point now for nearly 25 years is for you to realize and recognize that I have been doing environmental advocacy for all of that time, very literally fighting the good fight for our natural resources and all the communities, human and non-human, who depend upon the beautiful Delaware River and every square inch of its watershed. And so, the concept that I'm going to talk to you about comes as a result of my 25 years of doing advocacy, realizing that our current system of environmental protection laws is failing us, and that we need a new path, a new path for environmental protection here in the United States of America. The fact of the matter is, when you look at the local level, the state level, and the federal level, we very literally have hundreds of thousands of environmental protection laws on the books. And as each of these laws has been passed and as each of these laws has been implemented, they have accomplished a degree of, of good when it comes to environmental protection. And we want to recognize that. They have reduced pollution. They have prevented illnesses. They have very literally saved people's lives, protected communities from droughts and from floods and from wildfires, created jobs and supported good uh, local healthy economies, but they've only accomplished those tasks and so much more to a certain predetermined level, a level predetermined in how the laws are written and how the laws are implemented. Um, the fact of the matter is, right, fundamentally, our system of environmental protection laws accepts pollution and degradation as a foregone conclusion. It assumes it's going to happen. It expects it's going to happen. 
If you talk to many regulators and legislators, they will tell you that it's necessary for pollution and degradation to happen in order to have economic growth. And so as a result, all of these environmental protection laws are written in order to address pollution and degradation to a certain predetermined level. And beyond that, beyond that, their goal is to manage the how, the when, the where pollution is going to take place. But they are not written to, in the first instance, in the first instance, to focus on preventing pollution and preventing harm. And so as a result, when we look across the nation, we can actually see how, how this approach to environmental protection is failing us, is fundamentally failing us and failing communities across the nation. Um, and we can see that through real world examples about what's actually happening. We have communities like the community of Paulsboro, New Jersey, that find that their drinking water is contaminated with a dangerous family of chemicals known as perfluorinated chemicals. There are all kinds of PFCs. There's PFOA and PFOS and PFNA and more. The fact of the matter is all of these PFCs, all of these PFCs are known human carcinogens and have very serious health consequences for those who have the misfortune of coming into contact with them, let alone those who have the misfortune of very literally drinking PFCs in their drinking water unbeknownst to them for literally decades. Now these PFCs got into the drinking water of the people of Paulsboro um, very legally very legally. The use of PFCs by industry, the Army, and the Navy has taken place legally over um, many, many years. And as a result, these PFCs have gotten into our environment and into the drinking water supplies of the people of Paulsboro. But it's not only the people of Paulsboro who have their, their drinking water contaminated with PFCs. We actually have communities across the nation that are being similarly impacted. And again, this impact is the result of the very legal use by industry, the Army, and the Navy. Um, but it's not just the people of Paulsboro that are being impacted by pollution and degradation. We have families like the Stauffer family who find themselves living next to a highly contaminated site known as the Bishop Tube site. The Bishop Tube site is super saturated with a variety of contaminants, including one known as trichloroethylene, TCE. TCE, like PFCs, have very serious health consequences for people who have the misfortune of coming into contact with it. Now, this site has been um, super saturated with TCE for literally decades now, and the government has known about the dangerous conditions at the Bishop Tube site for nearly 30 years at this point. And yet, no meaningful action has taken place to actually clean up this site. And as a result, the pollution plume has been allowed to spread nearly a mile away from the Bishop Tube site, bringing TCE to new environments, to new communities in the region. It's not just the people uh, of, uh, that live next to the Bishop Tube site that find themselves exposed to a super toxic site like Bishop Tube. We actually have communities across the nation who find right in the heart of their communities, on the outskirts of their communities, or maybe very literally right next door, um, find that they live next to or nearby sites that are highly contaminated with dangerous toxins of all kinds. Um, that in some cases are being addressed by government officials, but in many, many cases, in too many cases, in literally thousands and thousands of cases, are being allowed to sit being left unaddressed by state and federal government officials. We have communities like the community of Minnesing, who within the last 10 years found that they were about to have a fracked gas compressor station built right in the heart of their community. Now the people of Minnesing didn't want this fracked gas compressor station built in the heart of their community because it is known that fracked gas compressor stations of this kind are a serious source of hazardous air pollutants. And it's known that people who have the misfortune of living next to sites like these suffer health consequences of all kinds. Despite the fact that we know this about fracked gas compressor stations, despite the fact that the people of Minnesink got organized and fought against the construction of this fracked gas compressor station, despite the fact that we have all of these state and federal laws in place that are supposed to protect our communities from pollution and environmental degradation, 
the people of Minnesing have this fracked gas compressor station operating right in the heart of their rural community today. And if you go to Minnesink and you speak with the people, they will tell you how since this compressor station has been put into operation, they will tell you how the quality of their lives has suffered from the 24-7 noise, light, and pollution that comes from this site. They will tell you how their property values how their property values have degraded, so much so that many of them who want to sell in order to be able to move away can't afford to do so because they can't sell their property for enough money. They will tell you about how their health has suffered as a result of the pollution that's being released from this fracked gas compressor station. But it's not just the people of Minnesink that are being exposed to dangerous pollutants um, being released to the air very literally or very legally. We have communities across the nation that are being exposed to air contamination of all kinds from a wide variety of sources, all being released despite all of these environmental protection laws that we have in place. We have minority communities across the nation who continue to be targeted unfairly for highly polluting operations and activities. Right? If you are a minority community, if you are a low-income community, if you are an immigrant community, you have a much higher rate of exposure to dangerous toxins, whether we're talking about pollution and toxins in the air, in the water, or on the landscapes. And in fact, minority children don't have to wait to be born to have a higher rate of exposure to dangerous toxins that will impact their health and their lives and even their capacity to learn throughout the length of their life, right? Minority children have a much higher rate of exposure to dangerous toxins while they are forming in the womb before they're ever even born. It's not just the people who are being impacted by pollution and degradation. Plants and animal species of all kinds are being impacted as well. This is one of the few Atlantic sturgeon that's actually born in the Delaware River today. The Delaware River is actually home to a genetically unique line of Atlantic sturgeon, a, a genetically unique line that actually exists nowhere else on Earth except in our beautiful Delaware River. At this point, because of the very legal actions and activities of people, we have less than 300 spawning adults left. That's all. And yet, Week in and week out in my role as the Delaware Riverkeeper, I continue to have to fight against ongoing and new proposals that are very literally putting these Atlantic sturgeon on the death block. And of course, we have species across the nation that are similarly situated, species in every single state across the nation. And all of this is happening, all of this is happening, despite the fact that we have all of these environmental protection laws that are in place. And when I go into communities that find themselves facing some dangerous industrial operation, proposal, development project, action or activity that is going to damage their environment, damage their communities, damage their very lives, people always have the same question. And sometimes they ask this question with their words, very literally with their words, but sometimes they ask the question with their body language. And you can see it as they sit in the back of the room with their shoulders slumped, looking increasingly sad and depressed about the information they're learning about this new major threat that is coming barreling down upon them and their community. And the question is why? Why? Why is this happening to us? Why are we facing this dangerous threat to our community and our environment? Don't we as people here on this earth have a right have a right to pure water and clean air and a healthy environment? Isn't that our right by virtue of the fact that we are people here on this earth? And I have the sad job of telling them, no, no, you do not have that right. You have a right to all kinds of things. You have a right to free speech and freedom of religion. You have private property rights. You have due process rights. In many states, you have a right to get divorced. In the state of New York, you have a constitutional right in the Bill of Rights section of the state constitution to play bingo and to gamble. But here in the United States of America, you do not have a right to a healthy environment. That is not your right, except with very limited exceptions. Actually, in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, 
You have a right to all of these other fundamental freedoms that we hold dear. And you have a constitutional right in the Bill of Rights section of the Pennsylvania Constitution to pure water, clean air, and a healthy environment. And so then people, when they learn that, they ask me, how is it possible? How is it possible that the people of Pennsylvania have this constitutional right to a healthy environment when we in communities in other states across the nation do not? If you look at Pennsylvania's history, it's just as rich in environmental exploitation as every other state across the nation. They allow just as much pollution to be spewed into the air and just as much pollution to be spewed into the water as every other state across the nation. They allow just as many industrial operations to overwhelm Pennsylvania communities as every other state across the nation. So what is it about Pennsylvania that allowed the people of Pennsylvania to secure this constitutional right to a healthy environment. Well, the people of Pennsylvania had this gentleman. His name was Franklin Curry. And Franklin Curry was elected to the Pennsylvania legislature in the late 1960s. Um, and Pencil uh, Franklin Curry recognized very quickly that one of the reasons why Pennsylvania's environment was allowed to become so degraded was because we were not recognizing environmental rights um, and protecting those rights in the same way we were recognizing and protecting all of those other political, civil, and human rights that we hold dear. We were not recognizing and protecting the inalienable right to a healthy environment in the Bill of Rights section of the state constitution. And so Franklin Curry proposed to change that. And in 1971, Franklin Curry put forth an amendment that would be added to the Pennsylvania Constitution that would protect, the recognize and protect the people's right to pure water, clean air, and a healthy environment. And would recognize the duty of government officials to respect, honor, and protect those inalienable rights in the same way they respect, honor, and protect those other fundamental freedoms we hold dear. And when this provision went before the Pennsylvania House of Representatives, a very conservative House of Representatives, much like it is today, um, the provision actually passed unanimously. And when it went before the Pennsylvania Senate, it passed unanimously. And when it went before the people of Pennsylvania, it passed overwhelmingly by a vote of four to one. And so in 1971, the people of Pennsylvania had a constitutionally recognized and protected right to a healthy environment. And so you would have thought, you would have thought from that moment on, community and environmental protection in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania would have been much stronger, much firmer, much more effective than in every other state across the nation. But if you know anything about Pennsylvania, you will know that that was not to be the story for Pennsylvania's environment. And that wasn't to be the story because very early on, there was an incredible overreach in how people sought to use this newly minted constitutional right to a healthy environment. And long story short, because of this, frankly, misuse of the newly minted constitutional right, we got decisions out of the Pennsylvania courts almost immediately that, as the Chief Justice of the Pennsylvania Supreme Court described it at the time, emasculated, disemboweled the newly minted constitutional right, declared it to be good public policy, but robbed it of all the legal strength that every other provision in the Bill of Rights section of the Pennsylvania Constitution had. And so that's the way things stood in Pennsylvania for 42 years. For 42 years, you had this great constitutional right on the books. But in reality, nothing had changed for the people of Pennsylvania. Then come the 2000s and enter drilling and fracking for gas, shale gas extraction coming to the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and to Pennsylvania communities, bringing with it all of its highly polluting industrial operations, 
bringing with it tremendous deforestation and land transformation and devastation of the natural landscapes across Pennsylvania. Bringing with it the, crea the creation of massive volumes of highly toxic frack wastewater. Wastewater so toxic that even the industry doesn't have a good solution for what to do with it. So they use it to engage in more fracking, or they store it in plastic lined pits on the landscape, or they ship it off to states like Oklahoma, where they inject it into the ground as a means of um, disposal in the hopes that they will never see it again. And in so doing, very literally create hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of earthquakes every year. So much so that Oklahoma in some years is now the earthquake capital of the United States of America. It brought with it po water pollution, pollution of our streams and our rivers and our groundwater and people's drinking water supplies. It brought with it the release of hazardous air pollutants of all kinds, including climate changing methane emissions. It brought with it the proliferation of infrastructure, pipelines and compressor stations and more. And given the state of the law in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and the federal law, when it comes to this industry, it was really pretty easy for the drillers and the frackers to overwhelm Pennsylvania's environment and to overwhelm Pennsylvania communities. But for the frackers, for the frackers, it just wasn't easy enough. They wanted to find a way to make it even easier for themselves. And so very literally, very literally, a group of leaders from the fracking industry got together and they went behind closed doors and they wrote for themselves a piece of legislation. A piece of legislation that was passed in 2012, signed by the governor. And when it was passed and signed by the governor, it came to be known as Act 13. Now, Act 13 was a veritable gift basket to the industry, as you can imagine, because the industry themselves wrote it. Um, and amongst the things that Act 13 did was Act 13 mandated that drilling and fracking be allowed to happen in every part of every community in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, including in the heart of their residential communities. It put in place automatic waivers for environmental protections that would apply to every other industry. It gave the power of eminent domain to the industry so they could take people's property rights and force the storage of explosive gas underneath their, their ground, whether or not they wanted it there. It gave relief to the fracking industry from the obligation to notify those who are on private drinking water wells um, whether or not the industry may have actually contaminated people's drinking water supplies. And it put in place a medical gag rule that denied medical professionals access to information about the chemicals that were being used on a site that might be harming their patients unless that doctor signed an agreement that they would not speak to anybody about these chemicals potentially causing harm to their patients, including to the patients themselves. Right? So it was a real, real gift basket to the industry. And the fact of the matter is, as bad as things were for the people of Pennsylvania in 2012, because of the passage of Act 13, things were about to get a whole lot worse. A whole lot worse. Now, at the Delaware Riverkeeper Network, we have been fighting fracking for years, and actually with quite great success. In fact, to this day, you don't have any drilling or fracking anywhere within the boundaries of the Delaware River watershed, including the portions of the watershed in New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Delaware, because of the work of the Delaware Riverkeeper Network. And we have been working to take our experiences and our success to help other communities in their battles against fracking. But we obviously had not been successful in protecting the people of Pennsylvania that were outside of the boundaries of our watershed. But we knew, we knew at the Delaware Riverkeeper Network with the passage of Act 13 that we had to find a way to take on this devastating law. We had to find a way to challenge and defeat Act 13. The problem is, this was a law passed by the Pennsylvania legislature and signed by its governor. So what can you do? What can you do when you have a piece of legislation that's been passed and signed? We could have asked the Pennsylvania legislature to repeal it. Fat chance that was going to happen. 
in Pennsylvania in 2012. So we had to find a greater power. We had to find a higher authority that would allow us to successfully challenge Act 13. And at the Delaware Riverkeeper Network, we realized that we might just now be in that moment in time when we could use that long ignored environmental rights amendment and make it the higher power that we could use to challenge the most devastating aspects of Act 13. And so we got together with seven towns and a physician and brought a legal action against Act 13. And we all brought our own arguments to the table. But the argument that the Delaware Riverkeeper Network brought to the table was that the provisions of Act 13 that we were challenging were unconstitutional because they violated the environmental rights of the people of Pennsylvania. The case went all the way up to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. And we got an amazing victory out of that Supreme Court. It was actually, at the time, a very conservative Supreme Court led by a very conservative Supreme Court Chief Justice. And the plurality opinion that we secured in our victory was actually written by that conservative Chief Justice. And I want to read with you a few of the things that Chief Justice Castile said in the opinion he wrote in response to our legal challenge. By any responsible account, the exploitation of the Marcellus Shale Formation, drilling and fracking, will produce a detrimental effect on the environment, on the people, their children, and future generations. That the natural resources that were being harmed were resources that were essential to life, to health, and to liberty. And that as a result, the provisions of Act 13 that we were challenging violated the environmental rights of the people of Pennsylvania and were declared to be unconstitutional as a result. And so in that moment, with this victory, we not only defeated some of the most devastating aspects of Act 13, but we very literally breathed legal life back into that long ignored environmental rights amendment and return to the people of Pennsylvania their constitutional right to pure water, and clean air, and a healthy environment. It was an amazing victory. And Chief Justice Castile, in his opinion, right, made very, very clear to the people of Pennsylvania that their right to a healthy environment was not given to them by Article 1, Section 27 of Pennsylvania's Constitution, Pennsylvania's Green Amendment. This was an inalienable right that they already had by virtue of the fact that they were people here on this earth. But because of Article 1, Section 27, this inalienable right was given the highest legal recognition and protection you can get under the law here in the United States of America. That because of Article 1, Section 27, Every government official at every level of government was duty-bound, duty-bound to protect the environmental rights of the people of Pennsylvania. And they had to protect those rights not just for present generations, but for future generations yet to come. Now, since we achieved this victory, which was just in December 2013, just five short years ago, we at the Delaware Riverkeeper Network and colleague organizations who saw the power in our victory have been doing the work of defining what it actually means to have a constitutional right to a healthy environment. Because it isn't instantly clear what can stay and what must go. I mean, if you think about the right to free speech, the right to freedom of religion, if you think about gun rights, right? We've had those rights for hundreds of years. And yet we still have litigation and arguments over what it actually means in one context or another to have these constitutional rights. So when it comes to the right to a healthy environment, we are just starting that work of defining what it means to have this constitutional right in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and then defending that right. We're doing the work of making sure every government under every government official in Pennsylvania understands that they are duty bound to protect these environmental rights and that they have to protect these rights for present and future generations. And we're doing the work of making sure that the people of Pennsylvania know that they have these rights 
and helping them use these rights in their advocacy and their legal efforts to protect their own local environments and communities. But in the wake of our victory, of our victory against Act 13, as we were going forth doing this work in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, I realized pretty quickly that there was something more in this victory than just for the people of Pennsylvania. That there was actually a message for all communities in all states across the nation. The message that our right to pure water and clean air and a healthy environment is an inalienable, inherent, indefeasible right that belongs to us by virtue of the fact that we are here on this earth. That these are rights that are worthy of constitutional recognition and protection. And that as a result, we must rise up together, rise up together in states across the nation and demand and defend our right to a healthy environment. And I believe that the best way we can do that is to rise up together in what I call a Green Amendment movement. Rise up together and seek and secure the passage of Green Amendments like Pennsylvania's Green Amendment. And have one added to every single state constitution in every single state across our nation. And why do I call it a Green Amendment movement? Why do we need a movement? We need a movement because there are only two states that have a Green Amendment of this kind. There are many other states that talk about the environment in their constitutions. But to the extent that they're in the Bill of Rights section of the Constitution, they talk about things like fishing, hunting, and trapping rights, or the right to navigate waterways. They don't talk about the inalienable right to clean water, clean air, and a healthy environment. Or if they do talk about the right to, the health, to a healthy environment, they begin or they end the sentence with, and that's good public policy. Or they begin or end the sentence with, saying that if you want to get these environmental rights, then all you have to do is have your state pass environmental protection legislation. Well, both of those situations are the situation we're in now, and we've already talked about how much harm continues to be inflicted upon communities despite all that. And most important, most important, these other states do not recognize the right to a healthy environment as an inalienable right protected in the Bill of Rights section of the state constitution that must be given the same legal stature st and standing as all those other fundamental freedoms we hold dear. And I just want to say, of course, while we don't have green amendments in all um, those other states across the nation other than Pennsylvania or Montana, we also, of course, don't have a green amendment or anything close to it in our U.S. Constitution. And so then the question becomes, for every other state across the nation, are we in a moment in time when people are willing to recognize that our current system of environmental protection laws is failing us, that we need to find a better path, and that, in fact, a better path is available to us in the passage of green amendments? And I think if you look at the news headlines in every single state across the nation, you will find that communities across the nation are suffering, are suffering because of pollution and degradation. And so I believe that people are in that moment in time when their minds are open to the realization that our current system of environmental laws is failing us and we do need something better. And in fact, in fact, since we've started this Green Amendment movement, we actually have Green Amendments proposed in four states. We have one that's advancing in New York. We have one that's advancing in New Jersey. We had one that's been actually proposed, two different versions proposed in the state of Maryland. They've been pulled back now, but we've had two different iterations proposed in the state of Maryland. And we currently, most recently, have one proposed in the state of West Virginia. So people are in that moment. Now, people do want to know, right, what does it mean to have a Green Amendment? I mean, really, if you look at Pennsylvania, fracking is still happening there. So does a Green Amendment really make a difference? And I'm here to tell you it does make a difference. It's not going to be an instant panacea, right? If we pass a Green Amendment, for example, in the state of Maryland, we don't instantly wipe away all the bad environmental stuff that's happening. We have to go step by step by step and demonstrate 
how one action or activity or another is violating the constitutional right to a healthy environment and then dealing with it. That's the situation we're in in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. The fact of the matter is fracking was there before we breathed legal life into that Green Amendment. If the Green Amendment had been legally alive first, I believe we could have kept fracking out of Pennsylvania. But because fracking was there first, we now have to go project by project, moment by moment, engaging in that constitutional battle. But the thing is, we are having success in Pennsylvania. And I want you to know, in all these states where we don't have a Green Amendment, if we were to pass a Green Amendment, good things would start to happen right away. The right to clean water, clean air, and a healthy environment would be given the highest legal protection and standing you can have under the law in the United States. Bill of Rights protection. Bill of Rights protection. On par with all those other fundamental freedoms we hold dear. Every, gov every government official would be duty bound to protect your constitutional right to a healthy environment. And they would have to protect those rights for present and future generations. There would be a new layer of protection under the law. No longer would it be good enough for legislators or regulators to say, I've complied with the statutes or the regulations on the books in deciding to put this highly polluted industrial operation right next to this highly sensitive community. They would have to show that they did the constitutional review as well and that whatever their decision was complied with the constitutional obligation to protect the environment. There would be a changed focus in government decision making. No longer would it be on just simply managing the how, the when, the where of pollution and degradation. Now the focus would be on preventing harm first. Government officials would be duty bound under the Constitution to consider the impacts of their decisions, to consider the facts and the science that were at play. While they were engaging in their decision making, they would be duty bound to find a way to protect the environment at the same time they were advancing whatever other goal it was that they were seeking to advance. Environmental justice would be strengthened because now every single person in the state, regardless of the color of their skin, regardless of their income level, regardless of where they live, regardless of their physical or mental capacities, would have the same constitutional right to a healthy environment, and government officials would be duty-bound to protect all of us equitably. We could no longer have environmental sacrifice zones like we do today. People's expectations would be changed. No longer would they be going to public meetings hoping their government officials would make the right decision when it comes to the environment. Now they would go into these meetings with an expectation that their government officials would do the right thing. They would stand straighter. They would speak more firmly. And when they got the wrong answer, they wouldn't sit down and shut up and be sad that they lost. They would be incensed and they would rise up and battle on to protect their environment and their environmental rights. Environmental advocates that today are dismissed as tree huggers or fish lovers, that are called job killers and people haters, that are accused of being environmental terrorists or eco-jihadists, right? No longer would we be called those names. We would now be recognized for what we truly are. U.S. patriots that are rising up together to defend our constitutional right to a healthy environment. With the passage of a Green Amendment, the goal is better decisions on the front end so we don't have to engage in the battles and the advocacies after the fact, right? So the goal is better decisions, and we will get them. But when our government officials get it wrong, we will have immediate access to the courts that will allow us to challenge that bad decision, action, or activity that oversteps and violates the environmental rights of the people of that state. And so with that, I hope that I've sort of taken you with me on this journey to really recognize that our current system of environmental laws is failing us, but that there is a better path available. And that better path is the passage of green amendments in every single state constitution across the nation. And I want you to know we will start with the states. And in doing that, we will get better protections every single time we pass a state green amendment. 
But at the same time, we will be laying the groundwork necessarily, necessary to ultimately pass a federal green amendment. We can't start with the U.S. Constitution. We won't be victorious. We start with the states. But in starting with the states, we are building the path necessary to successfully secure a green amendment in our U.S. Constitution. And it's a federal green amendment that will allow us to hold our Congress and our president accountable when they, too, assault our inalienable right to a healthy environment. So I'm glad that you came. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. If you filled out your slip for a free copy of the book, pass them to the aisle. And Molly will collect them, and then we'll do the free drawing. Yes. Sure. So the question is whether um, um, environmental degradation is as much the result of the way people live their lives in the U.S. as it is being driven by the, the laws that I've just talked about. And absolutely, absolutely, people have an opportunity every single day to make a decision in how they live their lives, to, um, to live their lives in a way that is more environmentally protective or less environmentally protective. And um, that's valuable and that's important and every single one of us should think about that every single day. I mean, I turned down a plastic bottle of water because I was sure to bring my own refilled, refillable bottle of water, right? And we all need to make those kinds of decisions every single day. But we can't lay environmental degradation at the foot of these daily decisions of people. The fact is that our system of laws is structured in order to encourage a lot of these inappropriate behaviors. You raised the question of fracking and energy development. The fact of the matter is when you look in Pennsylvania and you look beyond Pennsylvania, our current system of environmental protection laws is structured in order to advance dirty fossil fuels, in order to inhibit clean energy like solar and wind and geothermal. In the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, we are using our Green Amendment to make the point Right? that the use of fracking and dirty fossil fuels is harmful to people and the environment and future generations, and that we need to restructure the law in a way that will encourage and support and induce clean energy options. Right? But one of the reasons why so many people in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and many other states can't get access to those clean energy options is because of the way our laws are structured. And all these politicians that we all have to listen to that say, fracking is a bridge fuel right? Frack gas is the step to clean energy, which is nonsense. It's not a bridge fuel. It's a bridge fuel devastation, right? But our laws are structured to advance that. One of the things that you get with a Green Amendment is consideration of, of laws and structuring laws and advancing laws that help people in their daily lives be able to more effectively be able to make those better decisions. We have so many discussions across the nation right now about single-use plastic bags and single-use plastic bottles. Our current system of laws very, it very significantly is structured in a way that helps advance the use of right, single-use plastic, whether it's bags, bottles, or other things. If we have green amendments that restructures the thinking to get legislation focused on prevention first, 
an anti-degradation approach to everything, right, then we can help people make those better choices by having those better options more available or having those bad options not available at all. Because truthfully, we don't know, all know everything about everything, right? Some people don't realize when they take that plastic bag or that plastic straw or that plastic water bottle, how devastating it is, not just when it ends up in the ocean, but how devastating it is on the front end because the creation of that plastic is dependent on the extraction and use of dirty fossil fuels, right? So it's a combination, but I absolutely believe that the restructuring of our laws to focus on prevention and anti-degradation first will help fuel the better daily decision making that will also help us in environmental protection. So a lot of us, we can all make better choices every single day, but we cannot lay the devastation of our environment at the foot of the people, right? We have to lay it where it belongs with the regulators and the legislators and the industrial operators and the developers that have set us so on this devastating path and continue to do so every day. So the, the, the question is, um, if we force this anti-degradation approach to decision making, what's going to be the impact on industry, right? And um, both their operations in the U.S. or whether or not they're going to outsource to outside of the U.S. Um, a couple of things. First off, first off, we have to remember, no matter what um, anti-environmental legislators and regulators like to tell you, a healthy environment is vitally important for a healthy economy. Absolutely 100%. It's been proven time and time and time again. So when we find a way to advance our, our, our um, business goals, our industry goals, in a way that protects the environment at the same time, right? we allow the achievement of those industry and business objectives, and we allow the protection of the environment at the same time. You can do both. In every single instance, you can do both. Now, if you look at energy, just because we were talking about energy and you go back to energy, it may mean that the coal companies and the frackers can't operate anymore because I absolutely believe you cannot engage in fracking and protect the people's right to clean water, clean air, and a healthy environment. But it doesn't mean that you can't create energy. Right? When you're looking big picture, big scale at that community level, there are many, many, many other ways to create energy that aren't dependent upon dirty fossil fuels. We have clean and renewable energy options available today. And in fact, when you look at energy, like in so many other um, business contexts, uh, if you invest in that clean energy option, not only are you able to create all of the energy people need to live their lives here in the United States of America, but you actually create more jobs. These are jobs that are more accessible to a wider variety of people. And it is demonstrated that with these jobs, there is a greater capacity to come in at an entry level position and sort of move up the chain of command to a higher level of responsibility and a higher, uh, consequently, a higher pay rate. Um, and in fact, um, there's so much research to show that for every million dollars invested in clean energy options versus dirty fossil fuels, you create three to five times the number of jobs. And you protect people's lives at the same time. If you look at residential development and how we, or, or even business development, if you look at development projects on the landscape, if you engage in development that's protective of the environment, um, it tends to save money for the developer on the front end, and on the back end, right, they end up with a more beautiful and environmentally sustainable and protective development project, but they also end up with a project that demonstrably sells more quickly and for a higher price tag. So they save money on the front end, and they make more money more quickly 
on the back end. That's good for jobs. That's good for the local economies. Now, you are probably going to have, right, some industries that are going to threaten to move overseas. And maybe you will have some industries that are going to move overseas. But as um, advancing business and industry in a way that is protective of the environment becomes a more accepted and desirable aspect of the U.S. culture, I think that you will see that less and less, right? Because industry, I, there are many industries, they, they, they want to do things the right way, right? But they live in a culture that's not supportive or approving of that. So we start to change that culture um, and start to bring things back. And then also, fundamentally, I just want to say, we're not going to be able to gauge everything, every, or you know, uh, dictate everything everybody does. But we can dictate what we do as a community, as, an, as a culture, to advance environmental protection. And I don't care what is the argument of the industrial operator about why we need to let them get away with pollution and devastation and degradation. I don't care what their argument is. Their argument can't win the day. Because very, very literally on this side of the argument, there are people who are very literally losing their lives. They are getting sick and dying. They are losing their children. They are losing their sisters. They are losing their mothers. They are losing their fathers and their friends. Maybe they are literally losing them to disease and illness and cancer. Or maybe they're just losing some aspect of them. Like they have that diminished ability to learn. There's so much to sh show how air pollution is diminishing the capacity of children to learn, which means they can't have better quality lives and better quality jobs down the road. And if we don't have smarter people here in the United States of America, we will all suffer, right? Because we all need smart people to help advance all the good things that we need here in the U.S., being, you know, people being as smart as they possibly can be, right? So I just, it is never okay. It is never okay to succumb to an argument that says it's okay for that child to lose their life so that somebody over here can have a job. Because the truth is, we can create that job some other way that protects that life at the same time. And we have to be real about environmental degradation and that it really is very literally that stark a choice in too many circumstances. So we are at the end of our time, I think. Do you want to do the drawing? Great. Forgive me if I pronounce your name wrong, whoever wins. The winner is Chloe Gavigan. All right.